Michelle. And Michelle will be watching the chat to see what's happening. And when we have our pauses for discussion, we'll discuss what's coming up. So either in the chat or put up your hand and ask a question. Um, so we've, we've built in that time in between. Good, okay, so we're recording as well, so that's useful. Okay, so we're, I'm going to be doing um, an introductory piece for about 15 minutes now on, on the dot for d project um, and its use of social justice. A little bit more than that, actually, it's gonna be sort of a, a quick run overview of some of the work that we've done. Uh, and then we'll have discussion. Then Michelle will be talking a little bit more about production at UCT. That's her specific area of, of expertise, some more discussion. And then we really kind of want to flip it over to you um, and talk about you know, what you're imagining um, the role of open textbooks would be at your institution or in your research. Okay, next slide. So one of the, our contributions, um, one of the aspects we were grappling with in this project was to come up with a, a definition of open textbooks. And perhaps this seems obvious to some people, but we felt that we, there were a lot of, sort of open education resources and other materials that were on the edge of being an open textbook. So if we look at the green text, open textbooks, are digital, free to use, and openly licensed teaching materials. That sounds quite a lot like an open education resource definition, but open textbooks provide more than that. And so we've, we've worked with this definition and come up with something through our experiences in the last few years. So yes, it's that first aspect, digital free and open, but these open textbooks are course related teaching and learning content. So they do fit with a specific course. So that's important. Plus they are published on platforms and in, format, in formats that provide affordances for multimedia, little feedback mechanisms, assessment components. So there's that interactivity that is also part of the open textbook that makes it special. The other thing that we found through our um, open textbook process is it allows inclusive, collaborative authorship strategies. So it's not just simply the expert producing an open textbook, um, uh, producing an open textbook or a textbook, but this allows people to really work together and collaborate around authorship. Um, and the legal aspect is that it can be legally shared and redistributed not only within the institution where it's created, but of course, internationally and beyond. So that's our definition. In our dot for d project, we have three components. Um, and they, in this diagram, you can see how the components are linked. And this is kind of how we've been working. It hasn't been kind of research first, then grants, then advocacy, or the other way around. They feed into each other. Um, so our research component um, was very important for us and very important for our funders, the IDRC. Um, and, and a unique opportunity to really research the grants, which was the implementation focus, and also inform the advocacy process. So these three arms work together. So the research phase included um, interviews with uh, grantees and other open textbook authors, um, collection of notes that we um, accumulated through the process, um, the open textbook um, applications for the grants. So the grants um, were small amounts of money that were allocated to authors at UCT. So those authors had to apply for the grant. They had to make a strong case that they were going to include students that they were going to, that they were concerned about curriculum transformation and sustainability. So we had these textbooks that were created. And then the third wing is this advocacy wing, which is part of what we're doing now. We are trying to share our lessons that we have. Um, we would like to inform policy both at UCT and at other institutions. Um, and this is why we're trying to bring in a more national conversation now. Um, to share the lessons that we've learned. 
Sure. So we thought it would be nice to share a, a slide with photos of, of our uh, participants. So you kind of get a sense of, of this mix of people and mix of different disciplines. So mechanical, en mechanical engineering, chemistry, architecture, surgery, construction, mathematics, etc. A great range of dis disciplines. And we did, when we were granting um, the, the money for, for the um, open textbooks, we did look at a kind of range of disciplines. We were very interested in seeing um, how there were different needs and different approaches according to the discipline. So those are our open textbook authors in the study. And so what, what was very important for us, and I mentioned this in when people were applying for the grants, we were very interested in their motivation. We wanted to know what was behind them wanting to do an open textbook. Um, we had ideas why open textbooks were very important, linked to social justice and curriculum transformation. But we wanted to see what the key reasons were why people wanted to do this. And these are the four that came up the most. Affordable access, curriculum transformation, the need for multilingualism in resources, and pedagogical innovation. So those were the four main drivers or imperatives around open textbooks. So we looked at those drivers, that was important for us. But what we've tried to do in our research is, is understand the relationship between all of these components. So we have our open textbooks authors at the core. Um, so they were our research participants um, but then we have all these other components around, around what they're doing. So there's the open textbook and how that relates to social justice. Um, there are broader social justice issues. I'll be talking about that in a minute. But what we also interviewed these authors about was what they were seeing in their classrooms. So it was not only about the content in the textbook, but also what was happening in the classroom. And that's where you see at the bottom corner, this pedagogical strategies also came into us trying to understand the role of the open textbook in the classroom, what the author's role was and how in some cases, um, pedagogical strategies actually changed because of designing this open textbook. These are the kinds of things that we were grappling with in our research. So I'm hoping that um, a number of you will already be familiar with Fraser's, Nancy Fraser's social justice framework. Uh, in a nutshell, what she does is she provides three dimensions of injustice. She provides an economic, cultural, and political, three different, these three different dimensions that can be looked at in a particular situation. So this framework um, was initially applied to open education resources in a much broader way by Hodgkinson, Williams and Trotter. Uh, other, um, other researchers have been looking at open practice as well um, using this framework. So a particularly useful framework for firstly identifying different types of injustices. And in our case, it's it's really focused on higher education and on education. Um, but she, can, she broadens this out to, in the first case, injustices um, economically, where there's maldistribution of resources and economic inequality. Then culturally, where people and practices are afforded less respect and inequality. So a misrecognition, a cultural misrecognition and then she talks about political, about people not being represented um, in any way in whatever it is that, that's happening, whatever, whether it's education or materials, people are not represented. They lack the right to frame the discourse. So those are her three dimensions. And then you'll see the columns going down are, if you can just go back one step, Michelle, the affirmative, just to explain this, she says that what we can do is we can 
take steps to affirm or address um, in the most basic way those in injustices. And that's a good step. That's a step in the right direction. Um, that means you are trying to make a difference to redress um, the injustice. But what she really wants um, us, us as educators or us as researchers to consider is how to transform the root cause of the inequality. So that's kind of at the, at the heart of the problem. Um, and that's really making very deep change. Okay, so if we apply this to open textbooks, Michelle, if you can. So if we apply this to open textbooks, if we look at economic, so we know problem with open te with textbooks, current textbooks at the moment, they are very expensive. There's absolutely no doubt. There's a lot of research done uh, internationally and locally that students don't buy textbooks because they are too expensive. They will take them out on short loan from the library. They will loan one from a friend. They will think of, of different ways of, of actually yeah, getting hold of the textbook that they don't have to buy the textbook. And then even when they buy the textbook, it's often not of real value. So we've had um, academics say, it's a big chunky textbook that costs 900 Rand or 1000 Rand, but the students only use one chapter. So a lot of it is not of value either. So this creates an inequality of access to textbooks. And so of course, by creating an open textbook, we are saving, um, we are saving the students money. Okay, so this is the economic argument for open textbooks. Also, um, making the materials accessible. So that's our affirmative response. Open textbooks certainly provides an affirmative response to the injustice of the lack, the cost and value of textbooks. To make that response transformative, so at the bottom of that first um, column, what we really need is more of an institutional or national or regional funding mechanism to support open textbooks and the creation of open textbooks. Something more kind of um, supported by government, supported by international um, inst institutions, some sort of funding me mechanism can be sustained. So that's the economic situation. Cultural, when we talk about cultural misrecognition in textbooks that we are currently using, so many of those textbooks were written in the global north. And although they provide certain useful um, definitions, information, content, a lot of the examples aren't relevant here at all. Uh, students cannot relate to the examples that are given. Um, and so there's a need for curriculum transformation. And there is that loud call throughout higher education in South Africa for curriculum transformation. And open textbooks provides an opportunity for this. So open textbooks provide a place where textbooks can now become local and relevant, relevant examples, local cases. This can all be used. Um, this can all be included in the content. And a transformative response would be around creating policy that would mandate this. If we look at political representation, that's where um, there's a lack of power and a lack of voice in materials. Um, so, sorry, I just, my son just appeared at the window. Um, <laughs> so lack of power or voice in the material. And so for example, student representation, in, students are not represented in open textbooks. And what we've seen in our examples is that students are, are allowed to create and review content in the open textbooks. And so become co-creators in the open textbooks. Um, and the policy, and then your transformative step would be that the policy um, can mandate and reward collaboration and student inclusion. 
So we've really seen that um, open textbooks have the potential to disrupt histories of exclusion in South African higher education by addressing these issues of cost and marginalization, creating affordable, contextually relevant learning resources, and promoting a more socially just approach to materials creation and provision in South African higher education. So this is what we've been arguing for, and this is what we've been writing about. So that's the social justice arm, and that informs everything that we've, we've been doing and will inform all of our steps ahead in terms of advocacy. And so now to just for a few more slides, I'm still managing to keep in time, I'm going to make a switch. Our next step, so we've been doing a lot of research on, on social justice and, and looking at, at these kinds of components. And what we want to focus on now in the next six months of the project is forming, is writing about um, models of open textbook creation. And bear with us because this is still very new work and this is kind of experimental. And this is what we're going to be focusing on because we think this would be really useful um, for other um, academics such as yourselves or institutional managers or researchers who want to explore models of open collaborate of open textbook authorship um, and and so we've started to to work along these lines and we've thought about these models on three so we've we've looked at the motivation we talked about that but we've looked at authorship quality assurance as and publishing as the three pillars that occur throughout all the work that we've done. Um, and this helps us to look and identify different kinds of models. So the first model that we, we see that we'd like to present um, is a collaboration model. So working together for curriculum transformation. Um, and our example here is um, an orthopedics textbook. And in the bottom little corner, you will see the total grant amount that was received. So in this case, there was an initial amount and then a later amount, which was 50,000 Rand. Um, and Michelle uh, did a lot of assistance in terms of the publishing work around this project. Um, the authorship model, and so we've, and we'll, we're gonna discuss this a little bit more because we, we're interested in hearing from you about what you think about this. We've tried to, create different kinds of authorship models. And this authorship model is where the lead author is the editor in chief, plus they're bringing in students and colleagues. So you can see how this authorship model is particularly collaborative. Then we wanted to make sure that quality assurance mechanisms are built in. And in this case, it was not only students that were giving feedback, um, on the textbook and on the materials, but also colleagues giving feedback. And this particular textbook went through two phases, a first phase where it was a self, they self-published. So it was in a, um, was published in our learning management system. And then later on, it was further refined and edited and was published through our library, our UCT library, Open Monographs Press. Um, that's called the Continental Platform. So this is now um, yeah, published actually by our library. So that was one particular model that worked very well. Um, another model, Michelle, next one. Sorry, it's just sticking a little when okay, I that's no problem. scroll on. Okay. Does eventually go. Yeah. Okay, so the next, the next model is a pedagogical model. And that uh, will come up in a minute, but with both the two examples that we have there, um, the lecturers were really looking at redesigning how they were teaching so that the open textbook would be included in that process. So one was a first year chemistry where um, they, uh, the two lecturers involved included students in not only translating work, but also creating definitions, creating definitions in different languages of concepts in chemistry. So super, super useful. Um, what they felt was uh, essential for chemistry one being such a, a, such a difficult course. So they created these materials in a, in a very interactive way with students. 
And then the architecture example as well, also um, content development with students. So students actually created the pages of this particular book. Um, so very interesting turning around actual classroom teaching spaces and really using them to develop the materials in the open textbook. So that was another model. Um, and then I'm going to just do one more before we go over to, to teaching. So this, so we have other models that have worked and as we explore them, we're going to refine that this, this kind of authorship quality assurance publishing kind of in a relationship. But we also had a few that didn't work. And so we also want to tell those stories because I, I think so often we kind of like to showcase the, the, the amazing work that actually happened, but there are stories where people were not successful. Um, and I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but really just focus on that why box. Um, and we did find that if, if a, an author was very much a solo author, uh, they were determined to kind of do this work on their own with really collaborating with other authors, not extensively with students, um, but maybe with students. We found that if they carried this load alone, that was a very difficult thing to do. Creating an open textbook is something you want to try and do collaboratively if you can. And then there's also the issue of time and timing. So. All three of these authors are no longer at UCT. This happens, people move. Yeah, there, there are just circumstances that are under, out of everyone's control. So that was also these cycles of time is something that's interesting to us. Okay, so I'm going to stop talking at this point. Um, I think I've probably given you quite a lot of information, but let's, let's have a conversation for a little while um, around what we're suggesting, any questions? Michelle, have there been some interesting questions that have come up in the chat area? So, so Glenda, I'm sharing my screen for view, so I can't see the chat. I think Yaku's been watching the chat. Otherwise, if we could just take a moment to review now. Or alternatively, um, you're welcome to put up your hand and ask a question that might be easier. There's a, been a lot of hello and welcome in the chat, and I'm not too sure if they've been any questions specifically? Please. Linda, I didn't see any questions specifically, so I think we'll take the questions as, as they are posed there by the, the colleagues raising their hands. Great, okay, thanks, Yaku. Um, um, Anil Matthew? Hello, Ma Hello Hi. Linda, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, I can, clearly. Okay, thank Where you. Where are you from? I am from India. Ah, great, okay, welcome. Uh, see, I, I would like to know about uh, any uh, open education resources you are uh, I mean, content you are generating in your institution. So I would love. Uh, I mean, I would love, love to know more about open text uh, projects around the world. So I am. I am doing an open education project. So uh, I would love to add it. So that's why. Wonderful. Okay. We will. We're sharing these slides, and we've got a number of links that we that we'll share in the slide. Um, that will link to resources um, and we have a website which is also linked to the site that has you know links to all of these open textbooks um, and links to UC, open UCT uh, where there are also a lot of open education resources that are available freely for use. So thank you Anil, thank you for being here. Um, Rasi? Um, colleagues, Glenda, yes, good afternoon. Um, I know that you're still busy with the research, but the question from my side is, is uh, um, so publishing at this stage has been, um, uh, it was a solo initiative and then published through the, through the structure within UCT and then also the UCT library. I just want to ask, have you ever considered or not ever considered, I know this might, this might be part of the research that you're doing, but publishing the textbook, textbooks onto a open repository like OER Africa or um, Malo or one of those so that it can become part of the resources that's open to the region as a whole because um, uh, an, an, uh, uh, not the institution but a collaborative effort like OER Africa by the nature of the effort attract um, people that would, that would not only participate in but also um, uh, um, get from 
the, the open educational resources environment. So mm -hmm. my question then is, um, and I know, like I said, you're busy with the research, but whether we shouldn't consider or whether you can't consider um, start collaborating with, like for example, the, the, our colleagues at OER Africa to, to, to not only publish within the means of UCT, but also consider publishing um, in terms of making it available within, like for example, an OER repository. Thanks, uh, Glenda. Thanks, Rassi. Yeah, so, so all the materials created are open to be used anywhere. Um, and I haven't checked lately on OER Africa, but I know they've just, they're busy doing a case study on UCT where there are links to the materials that we've been sharing. So what, what, what we've done so far has been, in this particular project has been pretty much UCT focused. And that was never our kind of end. What, what we really would like to do is, is be able to set up a network to collaborate. We'll talk more about that later. I mean, this is one of our goals of, of this session and other sessions that we want to do um, for, the, for the rest of the year, essentially. Um, and we would love to set processes in, you know, where we can do na more national collaboration or even across border uh, collaboration um, with other African countries. So we, we really want to try and share what we've learned in terms of models and guidelines, etc. But ideally, we'd love to facilitate those kinds of relationships going forward. Um, and so certainly, Rasi, that's a priority for us over the next six months is to get into conversations like that to see whether this is a possibility for us. Uh, part of the research, part of the advocacy work. Thanks for the question. Um, Yaku? Yes, right. Thank you. Um, if I can misuse this opportunity, I've got two questions. First of all, you indicated that you, you are funding uh, the colleagues who are creating the open textbooks. What were they typically using that money for? That's the one question. And the second question, how do you handle the, the copyright of the open textbook? Okay, so the, the spending money was most often on a student or postgraduate student um, assistance or research assistance. So it was mostly to, to actually get free up time for the lecturer in a sense, in that they could allocate work to, to a student or post postgraduate student. Um, Michelle can, can correct me on that, but that's pretty much what it was. There was also was money spent on editorial work. So, you know, that final edit to, to, for quality. So that's editing was certainly part of that process. But, but yeah, mostly for, for to, to actually support students or other colleagues. Um, Sure, what's happened to Michelle? She seems to have gone out the room. Um, so oh, she's joining us again. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, so that's, I, I hope that, that kind of answers the question. Yeah, that was basically, it was it's really what was used for funding. Um, then in terms of the copyright, that's a conversation that could take us quite a while. It's, it's a very interesting conversation. Ours was unproblematic. So we... There were two main factors. Firstly, um, the IDRC, our funders, specify a CC BY uh, license. So the most, uh, the Creative Commons, and they want just a CC BY. There must be no other exclusions. So we got the buy in from the academics that they would be happy that they would be able to share their materials CC BY. So that was something that we had to agree on right up front. We're also very fortunate that at UCT, we have um, intellectual policy um, that says that we, that as lecturers, we have the copyright over our teaching materials. So there is, isn't that tension between the institution and the academics. We can actually share our materials. And this is a big issue in South Africa. And I'm presuming Northwest does not have the same policy. There are a few, four or five out of the 26 universities that actually allow academics to have the copyright over their teaching materials. This is a very interesting 
and, and very important component that we need to discuss and, and debate. And I think there are members of the Creative Commons team here as well. So this is something that, that we're, we're busy talking about and negotiating. Yaku, I know you're on that committee as well. Um, yeah, so, so ours was relatively straightforward. But we can certainly talk about that again. I don't want to talk about that too much now. I'd like to actually hand over to Michelle if she's managed to come back because Michelle's going to talk about OT production now for a little while. Michelle, are you okay? Yes. I'm really just, sorry, I, I got dropped from the room for some reason. Oh. I had to wait to be readmitted. Okay, that's um, not great. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Glenda, I wonder, could you share your screen to the presentation? It'd be easier for me. Okay. Okay, so hi everybody. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about open textbook production at UCT. Mm -hmm. As Glenda said, we've been working with these um, 11 initiatives for the last three years. So I wanted to give you a, a bit of a view from the publishing trenches, as it were. What we're seeing in our landscape is a wide range and a lot of diversity in terms of authorship, content development, student participation, um, quality assurance publishing models. And as Glenda said, we've been paying attention to whether we can trace any disciplinary dynamics. And that's the work that we're doing in the models articulation at the moment. We're also seeing a broad range and a wide variance in the degree of technological sophistication in content delivery. I think as in with all other forms of OER production, there are, again, informed by disciplinary dynamics, some, some really high tech um, HTML, XML publishing approaches being used. We have authors building their own sites, doing their own coding of material, in some cases with students. In other cases, it's ye old traditional PDF in a repository. And we're agnostic in terms of our approach. We think it's all interesting, but we can see there's a varying range of needs and an increasing expectation on the part of students that they want dynamic interactive content. It's almost passe to have static material, um, certainly if you want optimal engagement. And so we see academics looking to the institution and to us with questions about where to publish and host this kind of dynamic interactive content. Traditionally, it's been the LMS, but authors and students are looking for more, more functionality and more reach outside just of the institution. So for instance, those, those, that orthopedics textbook is strongly focused on undergraduates at UCT, but it's also intended as a primer for practitioners who are in the field who need quick access to medical, resource, med medical resources. We're seeing um, a rise of new roles and responsibilities in managing editorial and publishing approaches. Um, some academics take a little bit more easily to this work than others. We've, we've also had a number of instances where people say, mm, I didn't sign up to be an editor in chief, but inevitably somebody has to manage or be the central pin for the process. And you can imagine the challenges of time and resources that accompany this, particularly because, as Glenda said, there are these very protracted cycles of time that a book production process plays out over. And as you can imagine, compounded by just issues of how life happens, COVID lockdown, move to remote teaching. So we see very well laid plans being made but then the need to be flexible and agile in responding to real life competing pressures and commitments. So we think that we can discern an open textbook life cycle in terms of the grantee initiatives we've been working with. This will look familiar to you in terms of any other kind of academic um, production life, life cycles, the idea of analysis and scoping and then moving through a set of activities that eventually lead you to have a product 
that you can share with the world. The life cycle formulation, however, doesn't always serve us optimally because authors themselves can just feel like they are in this tumble dryer of life. They're a sock in the tumble dryer of life and they're being battered about between these processes, compounded by the fact that these processes are not necessarily linear. You could have to be thinking about dissemination while you are developing your authorship strategy, for instance. And so we've, um, in our work, have been developing this three-tiered or three-pillared social justice production roadmap. And there are a lot of other guides out there um, that can give you um, really detailed guidance on how to tackle various aspects of textbook production. But this picture is valuable for us because it positions the social justice imperative, the driver that academics, that are inspiring academics to do their work, positions that as the overarching primary question or core of the set of activities. And so the question of whether you're aiming to tackle access, curriculum, language, or pedagogy denotes what your response is going to be and should ideally infuse the work that you're doing. The clouds which we've sketched above those, I think, also resonate in many other kinds of OER production processes. We know throughout there's the need to be very realistic about what kind of resourcing and support is required. And as part of that, who pays for this work? So that applies across the board, whether in manuscript development, you're talking about um, an academic's time or in resource production, whether you're talking about hiring a typesetter or a proofreader. And also, we see it's very valuable to think about, has this, has this been done before? So it's compelling to think, um, even in your own work, have you got previous iterations that can be built upon? Or is there something else out there that is openly licensed that you could utilize? And then also to have a very clear sense of, in your context, what constitutes success? So if access is the issue and by the end of your process your students have all at least got access to the teaching materials that you are teaching your course with big tick if you're undertaking this process as part of your drive for your professorship maybe it's not going to be as satisfying to you so um to have a clear sense of ambition and then for you what would mean success so i want to take a moment just to talk through these various pillars, which also will look familiar to you in the context of any kind of book production process, or in fact, any production process. And as I said, we're finding it helpful to help academics just first of all, identify which of these columns are they in, which stage are they in? because sometimes people are getting bogged down in making tough, complicated publishing decisions when they're still thinking about what is it that I want to do. It's helpful to, to just um, delineate the processes and the components. What we're talking about in the manuscript development stage is essentially a scoping and structuring and a conceptualization exercise. And here, think about all the mantras, you know, from the academic world about think before you write, about well begun is half done. It's taking that moment to pause and conceptualize in the context of who your audience is, what the problem is that you're trying to address, and which platform you ultimately do want to publish through. And I'll give you an example. We've worked with academics who use Instagram as the, the platform through which they're disseminating their textbook in a granular 
format or fashion. And so if you know that you're writing for that kind of platform, it means a far more compressed granular approach than if you're writing long bits of text for something that might be in a PDF or distributed in a repository. It's useful to have a sense at the beginning, what, what is the pipe through which this content is gonna flow ultimately. Also thinking about authorship strategy, Glenda made the point, um, and I think I highlighted this in the previous two previous slides, um, we see a lot of collaborative authorship. It's useful at this point to think about copyright and licensing. Who is gonna own the copyright? Does everybody have copyright to the material that, they, that they're presenting for publication? And it really helps, particularly if you have a lot of collaborators, to put time into bringing some level of uniformity to your process, wherever you can, if you can use style sheets and templates. And that feeds also into the ambition or the need to address accessibility, diversity and inclusion. So designing for accessibility in the authorship stage is, is optimal. Here, it's also valuable to think about how, if and how could you get your students involved in developing your manuscript, if not in authoring, perhaps in a quality assurance component. So typically at the end of a manuscript development process, you've got something like a word file of however many pages with the building blocks of your content, your pedagogical ambitions addressed in terms of what you're trying to do with your students and your curriculum. The resource production step is the, the packaging of that manuscript, if you like. It is producing the actual resource now as opposed to the manuscript. And again, it's useful to think about conceptualization and publishing in the context of your audience, the problem you're addressing, and the platform through which you're going to be releasing the content. In terms of content design and presentation, this, tech, this is traditionally where an external graphic designer or typesetter would come into a process that costs money. Um, if you do have some resources, it's, it's a great thing to spend money on because design and presentation just excites the reader and draws a reader in and really does help addressing issues of accessibility. We know that budget isn't, however, always forthcoming, but perhaps you could get students involved in developing some content um, or utilize something that's been developed uh, as an OER previously. Um, the editing and proofreading, the same principle applies. Um, tough sometimes to get the resourcing, to get external professionals, but we see instances in which academics are very creative in terms of bringing in collegial review, um, review of practitioners in the field, of students, etc. And in all of these processes, having style sheets and templates really brings cohesion to what is going to feel like, or can feel like, a very chaotic and taxing process, especially if you've got a lot of people involved and you've got a lot of divergent styles of how people like to work and present their material. Um, a point here about student involvement and quality assurance as well. We also see students involved in this resource production space. As I said, in some cases as voluntary labor in return for small incentives um, and recognition. And in other cases, um, in, in roles like actual authoring and proofreading. And then, so imagine at the end of a resource production process, you have a, a clear sense of what the channel is through which you're going to be releasing your content and you have now wrapped and packaged that content. And then essentially the publishing moment is the, the opening of the tap, as it were, in which that content goes out into the world. So um, a set of, of factors to think about here um, in terms of licensing, how the resource will be cited, whether you want to number the edition in the context of thinking about future updates 
that's always really helpful to think about at this point. You'll have a sense of platform, hopefully. Um, it's interesting to think, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of that comment about OER Africa versus your own home institutional repository. There are a lot of platforms out there, and I think visibility is key, but also perhaps take it a step at a time. Start with a platform that feels safe and contained for you, and from there, perhaps you can add links elsewhere. Um, and valuable to think also not just about a, a spray and pray approach of just putting PDFs everywhere online where you can possibly think, because you want to market this content. This is tra traditionally what a publisher would have done for you, but this role now falls to ourselves, to the producers and to the institutions to market. And it helps to have a clear sense of where you're pointing your users and your readers to. Also so that you can track usage and adoption. And I wanted to make a point about what we're seeing in terms of the value of sourcing reviews and how academics at UCT are starting to integrate review of course components like textbooks as part of course evaluation and capturing feedback from those evaluation processes and integrating changes into longer term refinement. So this point about maintaining the resource over time, that's tricky, we, we know that, principally because this work is hard, it's time consuming, you get to the end of one process and you're, you're ready to say, okay, I don't wanna see another textbook for another two years, but your students might be coming saying, I've seen something on page five, it's not correct. So it's going, it might come back at you and having processes and systems for capturing feedback and an orderly way in which you can update your content is very valuable. And finally, in terms of talking to the slide, I wanted to, to highlight the fact that um, that green bar at the bottom of the page, that is the bedrock. You, in my experience, in every instance, depending on the, the extent, the scale of the collaboration, there needs to be an editorial team, an editor-in-chief or a project manager to drive the process, articulate a content management plan and curate content, particularly in ambitious initiatives with multiple authors on multiple chapters in multiple environments. Um, it really can save your sanity in the process to have a well ordered a person in the middle of the process who is well organized and can structure your process for you. I'm going to pause there for any questions or comments. I'm looking in Michelle, there's, there were two questions unanswered, um, I think from uh, Professor Eva Ossia Nielsen and from that Jared from UNISA. So uh, yes. I, I, I don't know whether you can see them. I'm just looking now. Um, so, um, Eva's question Have the students been involved in co authoring the open textbooks? Yes, in some instances they have to varying degrees. Um, in one or two instances as full co-authors, in other instances as reviewers, and I will be honest, in some instances where it was originally envisioned they would be co-authors, but the material produced was not of adequate quality. And in that case, um, the editors or, or lead authors had to rework content considerably so those authors might those students might not have been recognized as co-authors in the end um want to be upfront about the challenges of working with students we see the rich very rich benefit but um it, it is not without its challenges um and then a question 
Um, just looking further down. Yaku, what was the other question oh, from... Sorry, I'm, I'm just seeing comments. I'm not seeing another question. It's just above that one from, from Eva. Uh, otherwise, Jared, maybe you can ask it in person. Yeah, indeed, that will probably save that will probably save some time. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for the great presentation, Saha. Um, my question was, uh, what were the reasons the lecturers or the teams chose to do an an open uh, textbook over, let's say, an open course that might be easier? Um, I guess for higher education, per se. Um, but I think there's also the the aspect of access uh, in there, and then or okay. an open textbook over an OER. Okay. And is there like some sort of like process or chart system that you kind of went through for this decision making process? So I hope I don't give too over simplistic an answer. But so the reason they didn't that they were not in the process of developing courses is that they, they have typically got their courses and they've they've been through extensive processes um, in articulating curriculum over over many years. And that work is on track and feels appropriate for their context. What is broken in the equation is the textbook that they have been teaching with. For those reasons that Glenda outlined, the students don't have it or they, they can't relate to it or they're only using a portion of it so they don't even bother to get it. And we're hearing over and over this mantra of, I can't do my job with this resource. And so despite all of these challenges, the academics we've been working with have chosen to develop an open textbook because they need it to get their job done and to be able to communicate with their students and know that they have their students on board with them page by page as they're teaching in the classroom. I think this has been amplified in the context of remote teaching where the absence or you knowing that a student, a certain number of students in your class do not have the resource that you're referring to makes your job that much harder. So I hope that helps to answer your question. It's, it's simply a, a matter of um, a need state of the previous open textbook that was there is not serving the purpose. Um, the question about a resource or chart that could assist in this decision, um, I'm not quite sure what you mean. I think, no, people come to, the, to these decisions um, themselves in terms of the need state they're seeing in their classrooms. Um, and then the other part of your question about open textbooks that failed, I presume their content is still open to be revived. Where do these failed projects end up? That's a really interesting question because often what is the, the building blocks of a textbook is other forms of OER. And we have seen that in a number of what we might think of as the failed textbook production processes, there can still be very successful OER production processes within this bigger life cycle. So I'd like to think that a good amount of content that is produced in the course of what might be a failed getting all the way through the three pillars is still shared online under an open license. Um, bearing in mind that a lot of these um, textbook creators we've worked with see themselves as open education practitioners and that's part of how they do their work. I hope that helps to answer the question. No, thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions at this point? Looks like all for now, Michelle. Um, okay. And we're on track, so we could move Great. on to parts then. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing, right? Or no? Yes. Or, um, yeah. Or you want to go through?
I'm going to stop sharing. Yes. Uh, no, if you could continue sharing, Linda, and then we can mm -hmm. move to our third and final okay. for today. Um, what we would like to do at this stage is to have an open conversation about open textbook production at your institution or about how you see OER and open textbook production happening at your institution. And we were wondering if we could get a suggestion from the room if there were any particular areas that you would like to focus on. Um, and we have three slides um, that are options as fodder for discussion in terms of either manuscript development, resource production, or publishing. And I wonder if, if anybody would like to make a suggestion or um, signal where a, a point, a focus for the discussion. Could I maybe come in? Yeah, um, Andre Gas from NWU. I'm Please. working on a project where um, I wouldn't call myself the solo author because I, I rely a lot on, on some available OER textbooks. And then I use um, student input in terms of editing and revising my text with surprisingly insightful comments up to this point. The project's sort of kicking off now. So the the draft version of the textbook is there and it's now in the process. It's actually prescribed to the students this semester, but some of their assignments involves editing and providing inputs. And there's also a chapter with former students discussing the benefits of what they, they learned. And this is about journalism, it's introduction to journalism. So maybe that first option you've got there, solo author and student involvement. Yes. That's what right. I'm currently working on. Okay. I think that's a nice option because I think it's it's foundational and many people can relate to it, irrespective of what stage of the the process you're at. And so if there aren't any other suggestions, let's let's go with that and let's do a little bit of an activity around it. I'm going to um, put in a link to the Jamboard that we've set up in the chat. And if you want to stop, oh, or maybe if you could leave this, this slide up just for a moment while we get into the... So before you go through to the Jamboard link, Perhaps if we could just pause for a moment on this manuscript development slide, which we have up at the moment. What we have here in these blocks are the different approaches we've seen at UCT and which I, I, I hope from the comment we've just heard resonate for you in your context. What we're talking about here is a solo author approach with student involvement, where students get involved in content review and graphics production, etc. Uh, solo, we've had a solo, studio, solo, solo student author who undertook a process with the help of UCT inter intermediary. We've had lead authors as editor-in-chiefs with student co-authors, and we've had lead authors as editor-in-chiefs with colleagues as co-authors. Then we've had lead authors as both students, uh, with both students and colleagues as co-authors. And we've also had interesting scenarios in which the lead or the, the coordinator is actually a content development facilitator with student and colleague co-authors. Um, so in that context, it's somebody that is facilitating a process in which content, in which others are developing content. We'd like to do a bit of an exercise. And now if you could click through to the Jamboard. We'd like to take 10 minutes for you to, to do a bit of thinking about that slide and those various authorship 
approaches. And if you could answer these two questions that we've got on the Jamboard in terms of what makes sense in your context, and then also what are your main challenges if you're thinking about this manuscript development process? So either in terms of authorship or any of those other issues um, that we pinged around manuscript development. Um, Michelle, you just need to check the settings. I'm not sure okay. if um, you've given editing rights. Um, ah, okay. Yeah, let's something to do that. Jamboard. Um, where do I do that, Linda? Um, in the share uh, on the side here, there's a blue share. Um, oh, yeah. oh, I see. Yeah, that's it. And anyone with link is an editor. Thanks. Done. So on the okay, just refresh. Yeah. If you could just refresh, refresh, and then yes. on your left panel, you'll see a set of icons. There's a little sticky note icon. If you click on that note, you should have a little window that pops up. If you could put some thoughts down onto a note and save onto the board. We'd love to see your thoughts and ideas here. Um, and yeah, we're going to give, um, yeah, let's say about five, five minutes to have a go at this. It's 10 past three, Michelle. Yes. Okay. Let's say five minutes. So we've still got, yeah, so, yeah. And we've still got a little while. We'd like to discuss this as well. So often these jam boards uh, are interesting. It's nice to have a, a little bit of time to just chat about them. So yeah, so I'll remind you in a few minutes that, yeah, if we could stop at quarter past and then we've got 15 minutes to discuss it and close. Can I ask something maybe? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, can you say a bit more about what you mean by what makes sense? Because I, I'm finding myself a bit stuck on that. Like since as an author sense in terms of OER sense, sense to who and to what ends. Maybe I'm overthinking it almost certainly, but <laughs> help me out. <laughs> so it, we had envisioned this as what makes sense to you as an author and what makes sense in your context. So I, I'd encourage you to, to interpret it in either of those two ways. Okay, thanks. Hope that helps. I think we all have different ways of working, and I think that's also part of the question. Is, you know, if, if collaboration is what you want, how would you go about doing that? And, and and would it be would you be able to do that? That kind of kind of thinking. So not you, you as the author and and in your discipline and in your context and in your institution. So this one is context and the other one is as an author. Maybe you want to start with the author one first. Um, sorry. Okay, I'll give you five minutes. <laughs> Thank you.
also just wanted to say that if if people want to um, look at the second question about what are the main challenges as an author in terms of manuscript development, you'd be really interested if you want to put some stickies in there as well at this stage. Finish up if anyone's got some last last thoughts, and then we can just run through. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your contributions. Let's do just a couple more minutes. Okay, I think Michelle, I, think, I don't see any more. You're welcome to keep typing if you have a, have a, a comment that you would like to add to the frame, uh, to any of the frames. Um, so Michelle, you can see my screen or you've got your Jamboard up in front of you, I presume. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm uh, now. So if you like, I'm very, which, what, where do you want to start? Let's what start in the context. Yeah, at, at manuscript development, what makes sense in your context? And I think people have generally interpreted this in your context as an author. So we see um, there's a comment about OER for local content curriculum transformation. Mm -hmm. 
are for natural science, professional development using colleagues as authors. So project managing process from authors through designers and graphic artists. Contextual content for South Africa is needed to make the content we teach more accessible. Um, at this moment, I would do well with collaboration or work under close supervision because I'm not familiar with OER protocols. That's another great reason to collaborate is that you can pool your expertise. And then localized is another point about localized open textbooks that can be supportive to student-centered and active learning. So interesting that that came up as a, as a thread. Um, this is maybe on a different continuum, this yellow sticker of somebody more in that facilitator role. Um, on to the next slides, meeting needs of audience for high quality but relevant local materials. A need, a real need for student involvement to empower them to take control of their own learning. Experience up to this point shows already that students have very interesting insights that you might not have thought about. By editing and revising the text, students make the text more relevant to themselves. This is necessary, particularly because so many of the textbooks are so focused on Western models. That is why it makes sense to me to use the students. Um, another comment about working alone. I know what I want to do, but I'm not sure how to communicate. I'm assuming communicate the work or the concept. Um, working with different colleagues with subsequent input evaluation from students, creating something that is less Eurocentric with an African perspective. Carving out time and space to be able to work outside of the institutional admin and structure, which often does not leave space for creativity. Also think my discipline needs to change and making that happen without threatening the old guard can be challenging. Um, Comment about lead author, editor-in-chief with students and colleague co-authors matches the need for a locally relevant textbook on linguistics or language learning. Um, points about institution recognizing collabor collaborative activity, I'm assuming in reward and assessment processes. And then somebody making a point about content, um, being a content development facilitator or lead author with student and colleague co-authors, um, large workloads limit the time one can spend, so more collaboration might help with this. Yes, so the idea of collaboration, spreading the workload and being a means to pool expertise. So I'm seeing a bit of a thread around the need for student participation in order to address localization and relevance. And then quite a few comments that um, point to the need for a lot of coordination. Well, the need for collaboration, and if you're going to collaborate, the need for coordination and having somebody to drive the process. I wonder if anybody who added any of the notes would like to say anything in addition, or if anybody else even has a comment on the authorship aspect. Michelle, I thought the it's a pink sticky, um, the idea of, of, of challenging the old guard um, and, and the threat. And we found that just to sort of share our experience, we had that with a, a few of our open textbook authors who had exactly that same feeling. There were there was this definite feeling of doing something that that might not be their colleagues might not be so happy with, um, but they still never nevertheless managed to do it and pull it off. Um, but there definitely is that sense of uh, timing and, 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 and care because people are sometimes reluctant to change if they've been using the same textbook forever and all of a sudden you come up with a new one. So that's a very important point. Yes. These traditional works have been used for a long time for a reason um, and many people are, are invested in them. Okay. I'm conscious of that. So I'm going to suggest we look at the other half of the question about challenges. Um, copyright issues, limited time, 
um, skills in terms of tech and process, knowledge, a lot of content to cover, um, not having access to financial guidelines and people that one has to contact to process claims. So that's, I know those logistical things are not trivial. Um, we think of authorship as such a, well, maybe an intrinsically creative process, but you need to have systems and support in place to do that creative work. So little things like financial tripwires can really set you back. Um, not all students participate. Also the, the copyright issue at Northwest University, um, less author, more editor commission. The problem has been finding content creators with deep subject expertise allied with actual ability to produce. Also finding solutions to high quality but low data image production. Real, real issue, I can relate to that. Um, time, alignment issues between lectures and campuses, funding for editing, etc. And then there's one um, point on the last slide about template abuse, trying to keep it simple, too much chart junk created by various authors using all the fun stuff and not sticking to content, editing nightmare between all the fonts and so on. Yes, so uh, templates are not always your friend. And like anything, it's how they're used, I suppose. But good point there can give people too many other things, too many distractions. Um, so here I'm hand up. Sorry, Glenda. We have a hand up. Great. Um, would you like to unmute and ask a question? Okay. Um, such a buddy. Would you like to ask a question? Oh, maybe it's not a, a raised hand for this. Okay. Yes, Michelle. So I was just by way of summary saying um, a lot of I think the the factors that we all that we all recognise time expertise resourcing the issue of reliability of collaborators and of systems and of processes. Um, and I think the challenge of also the difference between ambition and having something manifest as a, a final project um, or a final product rather. I think we all relate to the fact that people can be fired up in the beginning, but to actually walk the full process with a group of collaborators and produce something at the end can be challenging. So um, this is really helpful for us. Um, it's fascinating to see how much of the, the points raised, how many of the points raised resonate with what we see in our context. Glenda, I'm gonna hand over to you if, um, unless there are no more questions um, to do the wrap up on the slides. So just, just to close, thank you, Michelle, and thank you to everyone for contributing. So interesting to, to see the overlaps and, and hopefully, you know, it's sort of highlighted and made you think about um, you going through this process as some of you already are creating materials, some of the complexities that you need to be thinking about um, to create open textbooks. So what, what we are doing for the next six months, uh, I mentioned, you know, we're looking at models, um, and to do some more research, but we are really keen to start and to build on um, an open textbooks in South African higher education community. And we had a meeting, a very, very sort of initial meeting a little while back. And from that, we've added people to um, a list, an email list, and we plan to have two more uh, kind of stakeholder events before the end of the year. And the idea with this is to try and grow a support community in South Africa um, and, and look around certain issues of multilingualism, multilingualism and also um, courses impeding graduation, having a look across institution to how we could perhaps move forward um, in a more sort of consolidated way around open textbooks. 
Um, exactly what Rusty mentioned earlier about, you know, what about the possibility of OER Africa? That's not necessarily what this is. It's more of a national forum, although we have already seen that we have people signing up from other countries um, in Africa. So this is all part of a growing community for us, um, something that's national and then perhaps uh, further afield as well. So please, if you want to be part of this network, if you're interested in being part of, of a roundtable event, then please do email me. Um, you will also see a link there to what we've called a call to action, um, which is really kind of trying to generate this community and move forward with this community. So we'd love to hear, I'd love to hear from you. Please do email me if you're interested in, in being part of this community. So I think that's, that's all from us. Um, Linda, I'm just going to point out that on the last few slides, yes. um, there is a, a list of useful resources. Oh, okay, there we go. There are a lot of resources out there. Um, this, in our opinion, these are a handful of the really helpful resources we've come across. Um, if you want some references, um, the Mind the Gap resource is particularly useful in terms of it's a really comprehensive overview of open source publishing tools and platforms. And then there is an appendix at the end of the slide with a table. If you'd like to click on those links and explore a little and see some other examples or see more detail on the UCT outputs produced in our project. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks very much, Michelle. And thank you, Yaku.